Well, if you'd uh, direct your attention to the screen, I have shown you this face before, and I thought it'd be appropriate to show it to you again today. This is the face of pick and choose Christianity, or at least one of the faces of pick and choose Christianity. You know the kind of Christianity I'm talking about. It's the kind of Christianity that treats following Jesus kind of like a buffet meal, right? So you're up at the buffet line and you say, oh, yeah, I'm having some of this, and I'm definitely having some of that, and yep, having some of this over here, but not that stuff, and definitely not the vegetable medley over there. (laughs) So who is this guy? Anybody remember? Close. I got an Al Capone. You're in the right genre. This is the face of the infamous mobster, Mickey Cohen. And although Mickey Cohen was notorious for living a life of crime, there was one point in his life where Cohen made a public declaration, a public profession of his faith in Jesus Christ. And yet... There was something kind of amiss. As time passed, it grew more and more obvious that there was really no change whatsoever to Mickey's gangster lifestyle and the illicit activities in which he was involved. Eventually, when he was confronted about his unwillingness to leave his life of sin behind to follow Jesus, Cohen balked, and here was, here was his response. He, he writes, you never told me I had to give up my career You never told me that I had to give up my friends. There's Christian movie stars, Christian athletes, Christian businessmen. So what's the matter with being a Christian gangster? (laughs) If I have to give up all that, Cohen writes, if that is Christianity, count me out. Friends, we call this cheap grace, or sometimes, if you can pronounce all the syllables, easy believism. It's the approach that says this. It says, I want all the benefits of Christianity, but none of the obligations. It's the sentiment that, I, 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 sure, I want to experience Jesus' forgiveness. Who wouldn't? But I don't want anything to do with His teachings, His warnings, His commands. Sure, I like the idea of Jesus as my Savior, but the idea of Jesus as my master, my ultimate authority, my sovereign king and supreme ruler, well, that's a bit much, don't you think? Well, friends, today we're about to hear from Jesus as he tells his followers in no uncertain terms, if you want to follow me, if you'd like to be my disciple, then you'd better be prepared to count the cost. Because fair-weather discipleship, according to Jesus, is really not a thing. In fact, Jesus is about to tell us here in Luke 14 that if you're not prepared to do these three very costly things, then you cannot, that's the word he uses, cannot be his disciple. So, if you are here today and you do consider yourself Jesus' disciple, I know there's many of you here, that's kind of the point, right? It's why you're here. Or perhaps you're here and you're seriously considering Jesus' claims, then friends, this text, man, is this for you? Is this for us? As followers of Jesus, we'd better take a really careful look at these three cannots of discipleship. So let me invite you to open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to to Luke 14. We'll be picking up where we left off last week, Luke 14, beginning in verse 25, and Lord willing, we'll finish the chapter today, Luke 14, beginning in verse 25, that's on page 821 if you're reading our church Bible in the seat back in front of you. Luke 14, beginning in verse 25, and we're going to read before we encounter these stark and true words of Jesus. Lord, 
Today you're about to speak to those who you say have ears to hear. So, Father, give us those, we pray. Give us ears to hear. By the power of your Holy Spirit, we're asking you to open our eyes to behold the truth of Christ. To not be offended at His claims, but to lean in to His, to his words, to what He has to say. The, the one who embodies wisdom eternal. Lord, may we celebrate and run in the direction that He sets out for His disciples. We pray in His matchless name. Amen. Luke 14, beginning in verse 25. Now, great crowds accompanied him, speaking of Jesus, and he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It's thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let us hear, Lord. Well, friends, I don't know about you, but it seems like every week that we encounter the teachings of Jesus here in Luke's gospel. I'm reading, and it's like my, my very soul is laid bare. I mean, this is intense stuff, right? Who among us can hear these words from Jesus and say, yeah, no sweat, piece of cake, Jesus? I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much nailing it anyway. Anybody? I mean, if we take Jesus' words seriously, I think we have to sort of step back and self-reflect and, what do we say, gut check time, examine our hearts, our lives. Week after week, as I'm preparing to teach, I'm just humbly saying before the Lord, Father, I need your help to do this. How I fall short. How desperate I am for your grace and for your forgiveness. For the staying power of your Holy Spirit to, to, to keep me going. Because I can't do this myself. And I think you would agree after reading a text like the one we've just read at the end of Luke 14. That this is another one of those weeks. Isn't it? Jesus is serious. And he says serious things to a serious group of people who desire to follow him seriously. Here in verse 25, we see that great crowds, great throngs of people have been following Jesus. Of course, you've seen what he's been doing, right? Healing people. He's raised the dead. He's casting out demons. He's speaking with divine power. Of course, they're following him. And yet, as the crowds continue to amass, Jesus takes the opportunity here at the end of Luke 14 to spell out for them, these throngs of gathering folks, what following him, or being his disciple, is really all about. 
One of the things that Jesus makes abundantly clear is that following Him is no casual commitment, is it? Jesus does not seem to be interested in nominal, one foot in, one foot out followers. Jesus demands the highest allegiance to those who would come after him. His call to discipleship here is a total call to discipleship, is it not? It's it's all-encompassing, so much so that not once, not twice, but three times in this short passage, he uses cannot language to describe what being a disciple of his is not. By the way, that can be a very effective way to define something. When you're defining something, it's helpful to know what it is. It's also helpful to know what it's not. Jesus says three times to us here in no uncertain terms, this is what being my disciple does not look like. I'm calling them today the three cannots of being Jesus' disciple. I think we've got a slide for you here. Here's where these phrases are located in the passage. Verse 26, verse 27, verse 33. Cannot be. Unless you do this, Jesus said, you cannot be my disciple. These cannots of discipleship are accompanied here by three illustrations to drive home the point for those with ears to hear. Now, this is important. I think this helps us understand Jesus' language here. The the phrase he uses three times, cannot be my disciple, can also literally be rendered, be translated, is not able to be my disciple. Think about that for a minute. There actually is a kind of person who is not able to be Jesus' disciple, who's not even capable, for whom discipleship to Jesus is not compatible. Friend, do you consider yourself Jesus' disciple? I I do. So this has got my attention, and I hope it has your attention this morning. We see the first cannot of discipleship to Jesus here in verse 26. Let's read it again briefly. If anyone comes to me, anyone, this is universal for all who would come after Christ, anyone, and does not hate, who hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, the ones sitting right next to you, yes, and even his own life, he, here it is cannot be, is not able to be, is not compatible with my discipleship. Some of you here are saying, uh, (laughs) wait a minute, I have questions, Jesus. How do you jive? These are, these are good questions, by the way. How, how are we supposed to jive these words of Christ here in Luke 14 with other passages in Scripture? Like, you know, honor your father and mother, which is included in a certain list of ten things somewhere that are pretty important. It's the fifth commandment. Honor, esteem, love your mother and father. The first commandment with a promise. What are we supposed to honor them begrudgingly with an undercurrent of seething animosity? Jesus says, if if you don't care for your families, he models and instructs us to, to care for aging parents. The Apostle Paul says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, If you don't provide for your family, you're worse than a pagan. You're worse than an unbeliever. How how do we jive scriptures like this unless you hate all the people you love? The people you love the most. No discipleship for you. Well, let's pause because this sometimes happens in scriptures. God says hard things, good things but things that can be hard for us to understand. What do you do when you encounter a passage like this where you're saying, Lord, help me 
I know you're not contradicting yourself. I know you're not saying something evil or malicious. What do we do with this? Well, well when, you, when you bump up against a passage like this in Scripture, you let Scripture interpret Scripture. You go to clear places in Scripture and you ask the question, is this theme, is this principle highlighted more clearly elsewhere? Thankfully, the answer is yes. Whew. Right? One of them, if uh, many of you, I'm, I'm looking here at, at Nathan and others who are uh, c- come to our Wednesday night Bible study. We've been working through our way through the book of Genesis. There's some tough stuff in Genesis too. We just covered recently, not, not too long ago, Genesis 29. Some of you will remember when Jacob, you know, the, the patriarch whose name gets changed to Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, this Jacob. He's, he's working after fleeing from his family. He's working for his brother-in-law, Laban. And man, he's got stars in his eyes for his younger daughter, Rachel. And yet, it's wedding night. I, I mean, this is just this is bonkers. And the dad gives, her, gives him the older sister. Now, I have questions here, too. I don't know how th- this wasn't discovered somehow. <laughs> But long story a little less long, Jacob gets tricked into marrying both daughters of Laban. So he's married to the older daughter, Leah, and the younger daughter, who his, his heart is just knit to, Rachel. This is Genesis 29, 30, and 31. Easy to remember. 29, 30, 31. Why am I talking to you about this story? Well, because this really does, I think, help us understand a Semitic understanding of the language of hate, because words change over time, don't they? I mean, your grandparents, my grandparents would say words that I was like, Woo, Grandma, I don't think that word means that anymore. The word hate was differently understood in a Semitic context particularly all these years ago. Let's, let, let, let's read a little bit about it. This is Genesis 29, 30, and 31. And what we're going to see is love-hate relationship in a way that I think helps us understand what's going on here in Luke 14, 26. Now, Jacob loved Rachel more than Leah. That's sad, but understandable, Right? And here's the very next verse. He loved Jacob more than Leah. Next verse. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Now that is fascinating, isn't it? Did Jacob despise Leah? Oh, He cared for her. He included her in his life's decisions. We see as we we track through the book of Genesis. He had children with her. He provided for her. He didn't hate Leah. But God's assessment was hate. Why? Well, because the, uh, the biblical understanding of hate can sometimes mean to love less than. To, to spurn, to give preferential treatment to or a higher allegiance to someone else. You see? That's one of the ways the Bible legitimately uses the word hate. You might be saying, well, how do we know that's what's going on here? How do we know, Zeb, you're not just punting because it makes us feel better about Jesus' hard sayings? Well, we know because we see another parallel passage that Jesus is teaching through, and this is precisely what he's saying. I want, I want to give you the reference if you want to look this up. I think this is helpful. Matthew 10, by the way, if you're tracking our journey through the book of Luke, a lot of the stuff we've been talking about lately is aired out differently in Matthew's gospel in the 10th chapter. And, and, and here we, we see a parallel account of the same thing going on. Only here's the language that Matthew uses. Matthew 10, I'm going to read 34 to 38. Jesus is speaking. Do not think, Jesus says, that I've come to bring peace on earth. I've not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, 
a daughter-in-law, against her mother-in-law. A person's enemies will be those of his own household. Sound familiar? Family tension? Now listen to this. This is the part where Matthew's gospel goes parallel to Luke's hate-your-own-family language. Ready? This is Matthew 10, 37. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You hear this more than me language? This is what Jesus is talking about back in Luke 14. According to Jesus, there's a comparison going on. Our love for him, Jesus' disciples' love for their Lord, he says, ought to be so high, so superlative, so much greater than the love for any other person that when you stack up your love for Christ and your love for even, even the most adored folks in your life, your family, your parents, your children, your wife, your spouse, in comparison That love for the second best is like hate. If push comes to shove, it's no contest where your allegiance lies. Do you see? So this is what Jesus is saying here. Now, we would be wrong to breathe a collective sigh of relief at this point. Whoo! All right. I feel much better about that one now, Zeb. Thanks. Moving on. No, but we haven't actually asked ourselves the question, am I doing this? The shock value is still very much intact. Jesus just told anyone who would presume to follow him that unless their love for him is higher than the people you are spending your life to support and to nurture, to cherish and to love. You you read the word, right? You cannot be. You are not capable of being. You are not compatible with my kind of discipleship, Jesus is saying. That's heavy. So I'm just going to I'm just going to lay it out there and ask you to spend some time, just some, some, some private, personal time, working through that question. Jesus, are you? Are you sweeter to me? Are you more dear to me? Are you, are you at the place of priority in my life such that compared to anybody else, I choose you? We'll circle back to that. That's an important question. Jesus moves to his second cannot in verse 27. The second cannot of being his disciple. By the way, it's building on the last part of verse 26. Remember, not just hating your own family, hating your own family, but also hating your own self, your own life, he says. He builds on that here and continues in that vein in verse 27. Let's read. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So, in order to follow Jesus, if you must, if this is like a requirement, you must bear your own cross. We better better know what this means, right? We better be clear on what cross-bearing looks like. Because we got to do it if we want to come after Christ. In this day, bearing one's cross was not hyperbole for something that you don't want to do in the Christian life or sort of an over-exaggeration for something. Bearing one's cross was a graphic thing. It was a physical thing. It was used to describe the practice of crucifixion. The person sentenced to die, by the way, it was such a graphic and terrible way to die, they wouldn't even allow Roman citizens, no matter what they had done, to to be crucified. This was reserved for the outsiders. This was reserved for the traitors. This was reserved for the worst of the worst. And they would make you pick up the cross beam and carry it up to your place of execution. 
to show. This is what happens when you mess with Rome. You were, when you were carrying your cross, you were doomed. You were a dead man. And Jesus is saying, this humiliating, this torturous, this drawn out exceedingly painful death, this is the way that I want you to think about following me. What? Bearing your cross, then, is a way to describe dying to self. It's a way of saying, Lord, I've given up all my control. I've given up all claim to my own life, up to and including, listen to me now, up to and including physical suffering and death. That's what it was to bear your cross. Some of you may have heard the famous line from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who himself was a martyr, who said about following Jesus, who said about discipleship, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It's often been said then that the Christian life is a cruciform life. It's a, it's a cross-shaped life. Jesus says, you can't be my disciples without this. Make no mistake about it, Jesus is saying, all of my disciples are cross-bearing, self-dying disciples. This is hard. But apparently, the kind of followers that Jesus is interested in are those who put him so high above every other human relationship, so high above even their own physical life, that there's just nothing else in comparison. Jesus is saying that I take the place, the highest place in your life. I require the highest possible co commitment from you, my followers, relationally. Your closest family relationships are subservient to me. The highest possible commitment physically, up to and including, if necessary, your own death. Now, Jesus has got one more cannot. I know you all can't wait for it. But before he gets there in verse 33, he takes some time to work through these first two by way of illustration. He gives us some word pictures, as Jesus often does, so that we understand, those who are presuming to follow after Jesus, so we understand what it's going to cost us if we do this, if we presume to follow Jesus, namely... There's a guy, verses 28 to 30, who wants to build a tower. The second picture is a guy, a, a king, who wants to go to war. And these are not hard to understand, are they, the, these illustrations? We don't need to belabor them, I don't think. Coincidentally, from this first illustration is where we get the phrase, counting the cost. Did you see it there? There's a guy who wants to build a tower. He's... Does he not first sit down and count the cost? Well, of course he does. How are you going to build a tower unless you figured out how much it's going to cost to get the materials, to pay the labor? It's like part of building a tower. Count the cost, Jesus says. Just as you do that in your normal everyday life, when you're building stuff, or when you're going to war, right? He's, Makes it a pretty simple illustration. What, what, what king who's going out to battle before he draws up his battle lines isn't first going to do a little bit of basic research and figure out what the enemy who's coming after him is. And if he doesn't stand a chance, he's going to go about that battle a little bit differently, right? He's going to send out a delegation and plead for peace. Of course he is. 
So what's that mean for us? Well, that clearly means following Jesus in our lives, just like it meant in the first century, requires some calculating. Jesus is asking his would-be disciples to run the numbers. Apparently, the Lord wants us to understand what we're getting ourselves into before we presume to walk this road called discipleship. How preposterous, after all, would it be to, to act like this? Start a building, to go to war, you got no idea what it's going to cost? Well, if none of us here in this room would be so foolish as to jump into these sort of commitments, these temporal commitments, without thinking through the cost, well then, how in the world is it that we could think that we would enter into some eternally significant endeavor? Like following God the Son without also considering what that might cost. Count the cost, Jesus says. I want you to know what you're getting into. I want you to know what I require of my followers. And after these two illustrations, he comes, he brings his teaching at the end of Luke 14 to a head. He's got one more cannot of discipleship and one more illustration. And these really are, are also very simple. They function, in essence, like a summation, a summary of what he's been saying up to this point, don't they? Read, read verse 33. So therefore, that's what therefore is, it's like a summary word, based upon what I've been saying, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Let's just recap where we've been. According to the one who saves souls, in order to be his follower, his disciple, the highest possible commitment relationally is required. He's first. The highest possible commitment physically is required. You might even die for this, Jesus says. And now Jesus is telling his disciples that they must be willing to pay the highest possible price exhaustively like he just draws a circle around the whole rest of life here in verse 33, doesn't he? Renounce all that you have. Often the church working through this passage has used, I think it's a helpful phrase, uh, in renouncing all you have, this category, all earthly attachments. That includes your stuff. That includes what you value. The things that you hold dear emotionally everything. According to Jesus, being his disciple, friends, is a total life commitment. There's nothing that discipleship to Jesus doesn't touch. There is nothing left in the except this category. I love how Dale Ralph Davis describes Jesus' teaching here in Luke 14. He says, what Jesus says here is simply the first commandment in different language. Think about that for a minute. What Jesus is saying here is essentially the first commandment using different words. What's the first commandment? We'll go, go to where the commandments were rolled out in Exodus 20, Exodus 23. You shall have no other gods before me. Isn't that what Jesus is saying here? No idols be they people, be they your own physical comfort or life, any earthly association, nothing comes before me. Now, who's allowed to say that? Who's allowed to say this? God. This is worship language. Jesus is calling his followers to do the same thing that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has been calling his followers to do all throughout the Old Testament. You better put me first. 
which is, I think, another very clear indicator that Christ considers himself equal with God the Father. He is God, very God. Just as this third cannot hear is a summary of all of life, everything we've talked about up to this point, so the third illustration which helps us just make some sense of this in practical terms, is also a summary of what he's been saying. And it's a salty one, isn't it? These last two verses in chapter 14. Salt is good, but if it's lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? Answer, it can't. In the ancient Near East... Salt was used for all kinds of stuff. It still is, but it was especially precious then. Salt was not only used as a seasoning agent, it was also used as a preservative. It was even used, and we can kind of get hints from this from the text here, it was used as a supplement for fertilizer. But salt is only good as long as it has the characteristics of salt. Go figure. So if you were to somehow remove the saltiness from the salt, what's it good for? Nothing is good for nothing. And Jesus clearly is saying here, this is what a disciple is like who does not embody the characteristics of a disciple. You take the saltiness out of the salt, you got garbage. You take the qualities of discipleship away from the disciple, and you've got a poser. Who Christ is quite clear will at the last day be cast off. Don't write Jesus off. What did he say to John the Baptist? Remember when he was saying some hard things? Blessed is the one who is not offended on account of me. This is one of those passages that um, a simple child can understand quite clearly. We don't need to flesh out the meaning anymore. What we need to do at this point in the game is just stop and say, does this describe me? How can I be a doer of discipleship Jesus' way? Not the way that I've been taught. Not the way that my church has modeled it for me. Not the way that I... I've got the Savior talking about what it means to follow the Savior. And there's three things, he said, are not compatible with following me. If you have not, friend, as a follower of Christ, actually ever stopped and done some of this calculating that Jesus invites us to do, some of this cost counting, then perhaps this would be a very good time to start. How do we do this in 2024? We do this in a host of ways, but some of the ways, go figure, 2,000 years later are the very ways that God's people were struggling in the first century, and chief on the list is idolizing our families. Ask yourself, friend, do you love, do you prioritize people, your people, over your relationship with Jesus without taking away one ounce of affection and commitment to the people God calls you to care for and love, Christ could not be more clear. He better be first. So is he? Is he? Now, we could spend a lot of time assessing the stuff of our own lives and thinking about our children, perhaps, if you're in this stage of life, or grandchildren, and their recreation and their academics and their you name it, or our spouse, or perhaps 
for those who aren't quite there yet, finding that spouse. Perhaps for some of us, it's justifying a hard-to-please parent or boss. Do the people of your life, I'm not asking this question, Jesus queued it up, are the people of your life more important to you than your Savior? If so, Christian, it's time to pause, count the cost, and realign. Jesus' warnings come because He loves us, and He does not want us to skip to hell merrily, 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 or ignorantly, ignorantly, ignorantly. He better be first. How about this one? Sometimes it's our stuff. Sometimes it's, it's physically our possessions. I just bought a house. We're so thankful as we're moving in. And we're so thankful to many of you who have been helping us out, and, and we're just we're grateful. Jesus clearly doesn't call us to hate, to spurn the, the physical stuff of our everyday lives, but it's in idle friends when good things become God things. When houses, when cars, when possessions, when vacations, when the stuff of life becomes more enamoring than the one who made it, we're out of bounds. Just, we don't need to hit that anymore, do we? Just gut check. Assess your heart. How about this one? I think sometimes in 2024 we struggle just as they did 2,000 years ago with our fleshly appetites, sexual pleasures, food, for some of us, it's just comfort, <laughs> just being comfortable and prioritizing that above all else. Sleep. Are these things taking precedence in your life over following Jesus? One more category. Perhaps you're idolizing some of you in this room, your career or your future career, or if you don't go to work physically, perhaps it's your legacy, your reputation, your status, your image. I'll stop just picking. You get the point. Jesus is inviting his followers to run the numbers, to count the cost, and to say, Jesus, Am I prepared to put you over my people? Am I prepared to put you over my stuff? Am I prepared to put you over my own physical life? One of the ways I'm convinced that we um, try to play with the boundaries of discipleship is this. And this is another application point, I think, for us here in 2024. Here, here's, here's the simple statement. Don't bring an auction mentality to your relationship with Jesus. No auction mentality before Christ. You ever been to an auction? You know how these things work? I grew up on a farm. I've been to some auctions before. It's been a while. But you, you go to an auction prepared to bid on things that you want based upon what you think their value is. So you say, okay, I'll give $1,500 for that steer over there, but I'm not going a penny over four grand. Right? This is, this is what an auction is. I'll, I'm prepared to give you this much, Jesus, but I can't go here. I'm not, I'm not going past this line with you, Lord. This much, Jesus, and no higher. No farther. Some of us do this with the Lord. Yeah. I mean, I, I wouldn't relish it, Jesus, but I would be willing to strain my relationship with fill in the blank. My, my parents for you, Jesus, if it comes to that. But not my children. Not my children. You see? Don't bring an auction relationship or an auction mentality into your relationship with Jesus. If he's Lord, he gets it all. 
He gets it all. Now, I want to end with a few simple objections to this teaching from Jesus. And perhaps if they're not full-blown objections, they're at least (laughs) sort of gut-level questions that we're churning through right now. First thing, does this mean, does Jesus cannots of discipleship mean here in Luke 14 that in order for us to be good enough for salvation, we have to do certain things to get in? Now, some of you might be thinking this. Golly, if in order to be Jesus' disciple, I got to do this, and I got to do this, and I got to do this, have I done that enough? Have I given enough for God to save me? Wrong. That's not Christianity. That's not the gospel. And that's not what Jesus is saying here. You can't earn your way to salvation by giving up a blessed thing. Show me the verse that says, the way to be reconciled to a holy and perfect God is to give up all this stuff. That's a work. That's you working your way to heaven. And that doesn't work. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this, not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not the results of works, so that no one can boast. Giving things up or trying your hardest to put Jesus first isn't the merit that gets you to heaven. Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the grave and belief in Him is the only door through which heaven can be seized. But when you walk through that door, and when you see Jesus for what He is, and when, when, when you say, you are my King, you're the kingdom that I am working toward, then He requires His followers to live a certain way. And this is what He's talking about here. It's not the way in, it's the things that characterize your life once you are in. Some of you are thinking here, another objection or, or question gosh, what if I've blown it? You're just thinking honestly about your life as we're going through this text and you're saying, well, I haven't done that. I spent a whole lot of time not doing that. Newsflash. You have blown it. There's not one of us in in this room who has done what Jesus has required here perfectly. That's why we're reading Luke. That's why Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So that those who get lost, those who are distracted, those who fail to live up to God's standards can be covered by His blood on the cross. Because guess who else counted the cost? Jesus. As He was working for our salvation. Guess who else gave it all up? Jesus. And he did it perfectly. We don't stand confident here or sit at Friendship Community Church on this beautiful February morning because we've done this the right way. We do it because Jesus has done this the right way. Last thing, don't you dare, please, follower of Jesus, don't you dare sit here and think in your mind and nurse in your heart any kind of a thought that Jesus' teaching, that Jesus' call to discipleship is harsh, that it's unfair, that it's just too much to expect. Of you and me. Is the cost of discipleship high? Yeah. You've got to die to follow Jesus. You've got to give up everything. And put him first. But there's one thing that costs more than discipleship. And that's the cost of non-discipleship. And when you come to this Savior, and when you 
become an heir of eternal life. (laughs) When you get filled with the Holy Spirit of God, then there's no looking back. And all the things that you had to give up as a disciple of Jesus, you say, I would gladly (laughs) throw that aside a thousand times over. Now, what Paul said in Philippians 3, what I counted as gain, I now regard as loss for the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. I want to leave you with one verse to chew on. If you're thinking, this is too hard, Jesus, this is too much, Jesus, I just want you to write down, text it to yourself, or scribble it in your notes, do whatever you need to do. Matthew 13, 44, we're ending with this one. Jesus tells a one-liner parable. It's my favorite. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy. In his what? In his joy. He goes and sells all he has and buys that. What would possess a man, what would possess a woman to joyfully jettison all they have, to sell everything, and to do it with a smile on their face? What would possess someone to do that? One thing, the realization that what you are getting rid of pales in comparison to the thing you are getting. Welcome to the kingdom, Jesus says. This is Christianity. He is worth it. So here, the table is before us.